this is me. Uh, Rob has kind of introduced me. Um, and this is where I work uh, at CTP. And there are a couple of my colleagues here in, in the room, uh, which is down in Sevenoaks in Kent. Um, there were a lot of things I wanted to talk about this evening. Um, but when I reread what we said about the lecture, I thought that I better stick to that. I wouldn't want to get you here under false pretenses. So, uh, as we set off, um, I looked back over my slides and realised there, there are quite a lot of them. I have 13 slides with some detail um, on the matter of gaining a better understanding of working with old or existing buildings. That is, buildings that aren't necessarily historic, by which I mean covered by heritage protection legislation. I have just three slides on handling projects that involve it in listed buildings more efficiently, just to point you perhaps in the right direction. I have 12 slides, which are all pictures, um, which can't be said of many of the others. Um, uh, and I will run through um, uh, about appreciating the reasoning and philosophy behind um, making changes to listed buildings or understanding diagnosis and intervention on listed buildings. And then finally, I have 14 slides, which I will run through relatively quickly, telling you about the accreditation process, what it means, and trying to engage your brains on that. Um, and I can see already that there are one or two other accredited engineers um, in, uh, in the house. So uh, they can heckle me if they want to, if I get that wrong. First of all, though, under the first of those four ti titles, headings, I'd like you to imagine, almost to close your eyes. And I'd like to think, you to think of a project, hopefully that is of your own experience, that involves an old building. Not necessarily listed, just an existing one. Any project. And ask yourself... How will this differ from work on a new build? Because it will. It, there's no doubt about it that in terms of the overall shape of the project team, uh, the deliverables and the processes involved, there are distinct differences between working with things that are existing and working with things that are new. So let's have a look at some of those. It will, it will differ because the essential team structure itself, when you're starting out on the project, may be different. Because there are things you do in the office that are often different to what you would do on a new building. First of all, and I'm afraid to say this is bad news for some people, who like their mainframe programs, there's often no mainframe analysis. Well, almost always. In fact, sometimes on a, a, an intervention, a refurbishment, there's hardly any calcs to do at all, which is quite a challenge if you're wedded to your calculator. Also, on the team structure, you need an understanding of what you might expect in advance when you walk up to this building. In other words, what is it? What is this existing building telling you before you enter into the project? And I, I, I dare to say that comes from experience. And if you don't feel you have that, then probably there are people around you who do. So stick close to them and ask them questions. And you will often find on a working with working with an existing building, um, that your technicians, your senior technicians, and your incorporated engineers have a lot to play, a lot to do, because their understanding has probably come up through um, studies of construction technology <coughs> and the way that buildings are put together. Whereas a graduate, you have probably come up through structural analysis and geotechnics. So 
There are specific differences there. Now, of course, this doesn't mean we can't have any fun. Um, uh, so, as a graduate, or indeed, maybe you'll find a summer student to do this, you can nip down the model shop. And um, uh, I thoroughly recommend that if you're doing a major intervention, major change in an existing structure or building, um, then making models, physical models, models that you cut out with scalpels, um, is one of the best ways of starting to understand how you're going to literally carve your way into it. So um, there, are, there are some useful things that we can do in addition. And uh, I suggest that, um, and uh, we went in our office work with Revit as much as any of you, um, uh, but nevertheless, physical models, when it comes to working with existing buildings, uh, do come into their own. Please keep thinking of the project you had in mind. You're worried about things. We worry about things. Maybe with this existing building, you're worried about load paths, detailing, and investigations. Worry is a good sign, a good sign that you need to go to review. Worry is a bad sign if you hang on to it and lose sleep. The best way to lose your worry is to go through review, and that applies for both new build and existing. Reviews on existing building, on existing buildings will tend to focus on perhaps slightly different things that you might than you might expect on a new building. If at all possible, you want to do an initial review with your senior, senior member of staff overlooking the project on site, not in the office. You want to walk around the building, and if there isn't a space because it's too cold, you want to find a nice coffee shop or a place nearby and sit down and talk about it. And we all know that those kind of meetings are very productive sometimes. And that you might call a confirmation of brief and, me brief and methodology. Just how are you going to deliver this project? I would thoroughly recommend that. And there are other things that we would also focus upon, as I have listed. Think of the deliverables, what you're going to produce. And here I've listed some drawings. Specifications and, and other things, yes, too. But uh, drawing series. Is the drawing set the series the same for new building work as existing buildings? Or do they differ? And I venture to say they do differ, the way in which we structure them. Yes, a lot more happens when you get to site. And you need to allow for discovery in your drawing series. So that sketches, or what you might term them to be in your um, office vocabulary, sketches will have a stronger part to play and uh, the main reference plans uh, are just that. They actually are floor plans. Very often, on a refurbishment, you start off with very little on them. And then they become references on which you pull out your sketch numbers. Money. Is there a difference in the rate of spend of fees? The rate and when you spend them and how the project progresses. Yes. By definition, in a new build, there are no unknowns in the superstructure. Because everything is where you put it. By definition, there are many unknowns in an existing building as you go into the project. And in that rather caricature, caricatured profile, um, which doesn't show a stop-off uh, during the tender period and, and is a bit of a smudged idea of what things are. But in that caricature on the slide, you'll notice that up front we have some investigations which are far more intense than just going on site with a, a, a rig to find out what the ground conditions are and your contamination. The investigations are desktop. They're, they're talking to people. They're finding out about this building uh, and in addition, we see a long, steady spend into the site process. And that is telling us that we don't want to spend our fee too early. 
In particular, don't spend it on things that you don't know anything about. If you don't know about the building, don't spend your fee. Wait until you find out about it. This is a building that you start out not understanding. And therefore, if there is a material change of use, and I'll come to that in a moment, if there is a material change of use, then the investigations are probably going to be the most important phase that sets up whether your project succeeds or fails. Why? Because you'll end up having to justify parts of the existing building that are now taking different loads or different load paths. But if there is no material change of use, then the investigations are going to be pretty minimal. At the other end of the programme, you have the need for a effective and efficient site in, uh, inspections. Um, and some people, when it comes to working with existing or historic buildings, but existing um, in the design office, find it very frustrating that the building won't stop pestering you. Well, actually, it's the site that pesters you because the site doesn't know things, so they appear on the requests for information. But, but really, really, it's the building, isn't it? Because we didn't know anything about those things. And they keep on being discovered and found, and it won't stop it. And I'd asked, when you, if you reflect back on what you did at the beginning of the project, did you really expect anything different? Did you really expect it to be different? That the building would naturally be the same on the on the east wing as it is on the left, uh, west wing, or that the lintels don't, don't quite align all the way around the building and your details for connections have to be different all the way around? And the answer is probably no. I was rather crossing my fingers. Well, to close, having been through those uh, wordy and diagrammatic slides, I'd like to ask... What is a material change of use? If you've never, uh, and sorry about this, this is scribble, this is my scribbled version of the building regulations um, from a set of notes of mine. Um, but if you've never discovered building regulations, clause, um, regulations five and six, then I would venture to suggest that there's something missing from your education that we're going to plug now and you can go away and find out more about. Because regulations five and six define what a material change of use is. That's not terribly important if you're designing a new building, but if you're designing uh, changes to an existing one, it's of huge importance. Because regulation five says, uh, and I, I quote C to F, if the building is used as a hotel or boarding house where previously it was not, I've scribbled or holiday let, because that nearly caught me out. If the building's used as an institution where previously it was not, it's used as a public building where previously it was not, you'll get the idea. We're dealing with risk here. The building is not a building described on the next page, which basically is an agricultural building where previously it was, that kind of thing. If that's the case, go down to regulation six. Then that is a material change of use. Uh, and we actually see in B, boxed badly. In the case of a material change of use described in regulations five, C, D, E, and F above, then it has to comply to A1 to A3. It has to comply with structure. And that means your whole building. So beware. This is pretty fundamental to the front end of your project. Um, and, uh, and, and then the bit at the top just defines that. So where, where should we go from there? Well, let's have a look at this slide here. 
So here we are in London, Bedford Square. I picked this rather at random. Thus, I'm going to turn this on its head because a lot of people get worried about this. Thus, the regulation in effect says if you put it the other way round, if you're building a rear extension on Bedford Square and putting a new lift in and the use remains as it is, you do not need to justify the whole building. And that's by implication from the regulation because it's telling you what you do need to do for material change and you do not need to do it if it isn't. Similarly, if we go to Leeds and look at a library building, if we're putting a new cafe in that um, and uh, the cha there is no change of use, we do not need to justify the whole building. And I hope you don't mind me um, uh, emphasising that because a lot of people would start to worry about the building if they went into a refurb because they found something that they didn't like the look of. Um, I would uh, thoroughly recommend you have a look at uh, other documentation in relation to um, appraisal of existing uh, buildings. And this is a very good one by the BRE um, Digest DG uh, 366. Uh, if you want to look further, uh, look at this amongst others. And of course, um, this is where um, progressive collapse is also uh, very important as we look at change of use. Um, because uh, that has profound effects on the way we approach a refurbishment or change to an existing building. Well, that, that concludes part one. There were four, if you remember, when I started. Um, and I said this second one's quite short. Um, so second, second subject that we'll, we'll run, run through. Just briefly, handling projects that involve listed buildings more efficiently. And um, we, can, we can come back to listings and the listed system and what it is and what you can do, if you like, in question time, because I don't really cover it on the slides. Um, but I just wanted to point, um, point, to, point you in the direction of one or two um, things. And I hope you'll forgive me for this, because I'm going to point you to the, the series that we ran as the accreditation register. Um, in the, the Structural Engineer, um, the journal. Uh, we ran that from January uh, 2016 to June 2017, uh, 19 articles in all. Um, I had the lovely job of being edit series editor, uh, and I authored a number, and other people authored uh, a number as well. Um, so on the left-hand side there is a clip from my opening article, um, and down the right-hand side is a, is, a, is a clip from a little... A little word table that I keep of the, all the titles. So forgive me, it looks a bit rough and ready. Um, but there are quite a number of articles that you will find of use um, as you approach your projects. Um, not just, I suggest, for instance, the one um, on Filler Joyce Floors, Article 17, um, is, is uh, Rob Thomas in the library tells me is the, the most downloaded of all. Um, I don't know why we're so infatuated with Philip Joyce floors. I'm, I'm, someone tell me why, but anyway, there you go. Um, uh, but there are quite a number of things, and if you, would, if you like to regard that in some ways as the beginning of a syllabus for what it is then to enter into the mindset of conservation engineering, conservation accreditation, then I would thoroughly recommend that you do and if you come along tonight uh, waiting for the last of the four uh, sections, which is about accreditation, um, then I commend this series to you because it helps you on your way in. It's not definitive or fixed, but, but that's a good start. And uh, I'm going to read that. Uh, this is a paragraph from that opening article. Before looking in more detail at the conservation movement, the historic movement, historical movement of, of, uh, of conservation in the 19th century uh, that I went on to consider, before looking at that, it's worth reflecting on the goals of this series of articles. Can any structural engineer gauge, engage in historic work? That means today, can anyone in this room 
engage in historic work. That is, to work on buildings protected by heritage legislation. In a sense, the answer is yes. Certainly, rather like structural engineers can turn themselves to facade engineering or fire engineering or become specialists in computational fluid dynamics, all of us started in life in general practice but steadily developed a passion and skills that match the demands of listed buildings. Which, of course, says, as I've just outlined, that all of us can do historic buildings. It's just that some of us develop those skills uh, in more detail, the attributes more finely, and understand them perhaps with a greater passion. Here is one of the papers, uh, an extract from uh, number seven. <clears throat> um, at the top there, um, uh, and that also um, has a significant number of downloads. Uh, incidentally, we're trying to publish the articles as a book, or I have uh, been trying to. Um, uh, I haven't given up on that yet. Um, part seven, imposed load in historic buildings, assessing what is real. A very useful reference, if you're asked occasionally to impose rather silly loads onto the building. And in essence, it talks about um, the likelihood and probability of achieving certain loads, looking at through published documentation and research. Um, but it also um, asks the question, what is the building saying to you? Because if you impose five kilonewtons a square meter on a historic floor and say that is necessary, first of all, you're wrong because you've got the wrong building. And secondly, you're going to destroy it. We can put two and a half, maybe three and a half, but five, I would venture to say, it's going to pull it apart. A few pointers on conservation philosophy do come back to me on that in question time. <clears throat> now we've got the slide series with all the pictures in. <clears throat> um, so some projects that illustrate conservation engineering in, in action. I've got, um, I think it is, um, five little vignettes of projects that illustrate some aspects, one or other aspect of uh, the aspects of conservation engineering. And I, I'm, I'm looking in the corner. I know some of the people in the room here, and unfortunately, I, I gave, from the talk on here on in, I gave it to some guys at the National Trust the other day. He's going to be falling to sleep, I think, but there you go. Um, but uh, uh, so we're going to look at these projects and pick out some of the key um, issues and why they speak of conservation. What, what do I mean by conservation engineering? And that will become clear after the slides because it will then become clear as I look at the attributes that we examine when we do the assessment for, cons for your conservation accreditation. So I'll pick out some of these. <clears throat> and first of all, um, we're in Westminster Hall in the Houses of Parliament. Um, and uh, 2005 and 2006... And uh, we're looking at settlement in the south steps and floor. Settlement that totaled uh, in the centre of the, the steps there. That's a picture taken, obviously, before we um, looked at stabilisation works. Uh, of about nine inches between the sides and the centre. Two to five millimetres. And a fundamental question here. Is there a risk... If you're looking at a historic building, a heritage-protected building, why should you be given permission to intervene? Why should you do something to it? Uh, that goes for any changes that you make, but it also goes for um, diagnosing and repairing defects, and I would refer to this as a defect. Um, this is the most important building in the history of, par of world parliamentary democracy, so why on earth should one, should one be given permission to start working in this building if there is no risk? 
What is the risk? Well, thankfully, in this um, illustrious place, um, they keep very good records, and records of settlement have been going back to, I think, the late 1940s. Um, and really, when we looked at a series of uh, um, uh, 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 records, um, we found uh, that the settlement had been, on average, about one to two millimetres per year of settlement. And there uh, looked to be very little change in that. But that's a fundamental question, risk. Is there a risk? Uh, the other thing was that, um, so uh, this is anecdotal, but I was told when we entered into the project that there had been two cases of old ladies uh, walking through the hall and um, you'll recognise this from any patio or, or pavement you've been on. You know that you trip over it when the slabs lip. One slab rises above the other, and uh, people tell me if it's more than 25 mil, you can sue the council. But um, those of you in local authority, come tell me if I'm wrong. But, but here, we'd had two cases, anecdotally, of, of uh, ladies who tripped over and there'd been a lot of blood. Is there a risk? Yes, there is. There was a change of the way people flowed through the building. At this time, it wasn't the entrance. Now, it is through the visitor reception building you come in through here. Um, so, risk. Risk is a very important uh, thing that you, we are looking at with any heritage project. And we're assessing risk, and an idea of risk is very important. Secondly, do we have a diagnosis? Um, well, uh, this uh, Westminster Hall is paved with uh, nearly 500 slabs measuring um, about 1.6 metres square by 75 mil thick in Yorkstone. They each weigh three quarters of a tonne and the gaps between them are about three millimetres wide. When I first walked into it, um, uh, my geotechnical engineer, who's a, who was a, a very, very fine geotechnical guy, he said to me, James, I don't suppose we can put any core holes through these slabs, can we? Uh, to which the answer is, no, you can't. So, of course, what we have to do is we have to ha find non-sitting non parliamentary Fridays or night shifts where we are lifting those slabs by suction methods, uh, getting underneath, sliding them to one side so we can do our investigations. Investigations revealed... Uh, a layer of um, PT clay, organic PT clay, in the areas that were settling, and in two reference, if you like, placebo holes, um, the clay was not present where it wasn't settling. We had our diagnosis. We had our diagnosis, there was risk, therefore permission is reasonable to be granted to intervene. And intervene is what we did. Um, this was an engineer-led project, not a conservation architect. This was a conservation engineering-led project. And so as part of your project, um, you are going to have to be able to show the skills to manage. You're going to be able to integrate archaeology and geotechnics. In the center of that image, there is an archaeological hole. Um, as a conservation engineer, you under need to understand those. Uh, we need to understand the architectural and aesthetic elements. There was a conservation engineer engaged on this to design the handrails. And we need to be able to enact the works using exactly the right techniques that are um, exercising control over process. Those are all skills that we look for, perhaps not in that full measure, but we look for those in our conservation engineers. Um, two slides on the Temperate House at Kew Gardens, which was um, uh, finally opened, reopened last year. Um, the project, a project that in, in going through it will remove all the dead load of the glazing from the frame. Um, and uh, as a result, uh, dead load and potentially, obviously, the live load too, um, during the restoration program. Um, in order to understand that and control that process, we need to ask ourselves some questions. So we have a, we have a contract value of £25 million on this restoration, upward to that, actually. And um, 
uh, we need to have control over what is going to happen to this frame when parts of it essentially are disassembled. So one of those modern techniques, as we know, we understand laser scanning in particular for surveying purposes, creating drawings and maybe solid models. But also here, laser scanning gives us control over the geometry of the building so that as we get part of the way through the project, if someone says, oh dear, I think it's changed shape, that's settled. We know exactly whether it has moved, deflected or not, or sprung, sprung up in this case, um, because we have a, a scan as a reference point in three dimensions. And that control over damage is essential or risk is important. Will it move? Understanding the basic goals are important. When I first walked into the temperate house, I asked the head gardener, I said, what is this project about? This is, this is next to the palm house, you know, where the triffids grew, because that's where it all started with the triffids. Um, the palm house and the temperate house are not, not exclusively the history of the development of iron in the 19th century, but they are a large part of it. We're seeing a building immediately before the Great Exhibition and one immediately afterwards, the temperate house. So there am I, fixed on the idea of this conservation project, and the head gardener tells me this is about quality of light and quality of air. This project isn't anything about conservation. He's the head gardener. We need to understand what our projects basically are delivering if we're actually to know what the heritage dividend is of conserving that building. Um, two slides um, uh, about an adobe mud watchtower in the middle of an oasis in Abu Dhabi. Um, the client um, I had probably spent more than this, but spent £100,000 in fees on this and two other small buildings. I came back from Abu Dhabi and my wife said, you went all that way to look at that heap of stones. That's my career. Um, and why is this? If you work in the Middle East, you will recognise you will recognize this architectural uh, typology. You will recognize the round watchtower with the dog tooth crenellations on top as being a specific feature of modern, um, modern but um, vernacular, aping the vernacular uh, architecture. And this is one of the very last surviving examples of that typology, stuffed in the middle of the desert um, in, in Liwa Oasis. Um, so actually, this is an artifact now. We're dealing with museum piece. We don't often, often deal with that, but the, here is a museum piece. And understanding that cultural significance and that typology is an essential part to um, appreciating the role of the conservation engineer. And you might say, well, what calculations am I doing on that? Well, of course, you know, just it's not even worth asking the question. We are dealing with appropriate techniques. We're dealing with the fact that we are people of scientific background who understand, maybe going back to our A-level chemistry, how we are going to characterize the mortars, um, the, the, um, the material that's holding this adobe together. We're there talking with the conservators about the field laboratory set up next to it in, dare I say, in heat between 39 and 46 degrees centigrade, where we, were, where we worked for three days. Um, um, and how to characterize those and to achieve stability through, through grouting techniques. And you'll see in that slide that I had recommended some, some hoop, temporary hoop restraint. Um, and those are indeed very carefully placed lorry straps. Let's go to Trinidad. And um, by this time, you'll be saying, yeah, I want to be a conservation engineer. Um, 
So here we are in Trinidad, and actually I want to jump to my third slide, really. I don't really want to dwell on this one here, nor the next one, which is taken of the same building, essentially at the same moment in the same week, which I took pointing down from the tallest cherry picker in Trinidad. But I want to look at this slide here. Because this is, again, a cultural appreciation. This is a, a country in Trinidad in about 2010, that at the time, and I'm afraid I haven't tracked, tracked the progress of heritage protection legislation there, but had no heritage protection legislation, like our listing or our scheduled monument systems. And buildings were being demolished, um, uh, not willy-nilly, um, but as, as developers got hold of them and worked through, these are essentially very fine colonial representations of an age, a 19th century age. There was a growing appreciation that these are buildings, were buildings that shaped their society. And at night time, people would come out and stick posters up on the outside of the railings, asking people not to have these demolished. This, rather like the arrival of the Ancient Monuments Act in 80, around 1882 in this country. This is a public outcry. That is what resulted in our first heritage protection legislation. That is what is happening here in this slide. <laughs> Lastly, then, one, two, three, and our last point. Understanding the value of becoming a conservation accredited engineer. And uh, so I've got a load of slides here, um, and I'm going to um, run through them. Um, I could run through them slowly or quickly. Um, I'm going to go through them reasonably quickly, and I think we will return to them if we need to. Um, uh, so this is actually going to tell you what it is to be an accredited engineer and how you become one. Um, and, um, uh, and then we'll close, and you can ask me Lots of difficult questions, um, if you want to. Um, care. Uh, we, we, I suppose we prefer the long-winded name, the Conservation Accreditation Register for Engineers, um, but care is for short. Um, Ian Hume was uh, Chief Engineer at Historic England, and he was incensed when a public um, notice came out asking for services for restoration of the Anderton boat lift on our canal network, a magnificent um, piece of 19th century engineering. Um, uh, he was incensed because it asked for a, a project leader who was an architect. And so he thought, no, we're going to have a register for engineers. Uh, and he was the one who started it, and he was the first chair, so he is my predecessor. And in actual fact, you may, may have uh, spotted that he and I authored that paper that I showed on loading in historic buildings that appears in uh, the, the journal The Structural Engineer. Um, this is uh, the, the marks of accreditation. They include um, getting published on the register, which is a, a, an open document and everyone can read, and getting a nice certificate. Uh, that you can hang on, on your wall alongside your other certificates. Um, and um, uh, so, so this is actually, if you want to be accredited, this is, you know, this is what you're aiming for, and it's got a nice little gold seal on it that's embossed. Lovely. Uh, you, you then put it on the scanner and send it out with the projects that you want to win. Um, when, it was, when it started, uh, chartership um, or incorporation wasn't essential, but it is now. So in order to be um, a, a conservation accredited engineer, you must first be incorporated or chartered. I hope that makes sense. Uh, this is an anecdote. Uh, uh, I better be brisk with my anecdotes. Um, I, I actually I had an email from a lady. I get e strange emails sometimes. A lady in um, Virginia, in the U.S., um, uh, at home, and I was I was 
I was doing some work one Sunday afternoon and I happened to have a spare moment and I responded in full to it. And she wanted... She, her son had been studying my profile and um, wanted to be what I was because apparently it was the best job in the world. Now, there are two people from my office in, in sitting there and, and they'll have a chuckle because, you know, I sit there surrounded by bits of paper and everything and making tea with other people. But he thought I had the best, um, uh, best job in the world. Um, and uh, what I said to her was, I think, music to her ears, that I would not trust a conservation engineer who cannot make a five-storey steel frame stand up. So if you don't think you can do that, then please go away and do that first and then go into conservation. Uh, why should you be allowed to look after some of our country's finest building if you can't even make a new building stand up? Um, oh, some benefits. Um, joining CARE, actually, uh, talking about benefits, but I, it's a commitment. It's a commitment to keep up and to keep going. But it is a pleasure to be committed to working with historic fabric Um, we are a community. Uh, when you become conservation accredited, we are competitors and colleagues and friends. Um, I, I suppose I have to say this because I'm current chair, but I and, and the panel and, and those people we see regularly at our, our annual meeting, we are wholly committed to raising standards in conservation. Engineers have had a poor reputation in this field, and together we can show much more respect to our historic buildings. And as part of, uh, a part of doing that, I feel it my business to go, go and do things, uh, including um, volunteering um, for this lecture this evening, and I'm very grateful because the, the turnout, um, I'm told, the number of people registered was among the highest of lectures in this, um, in this program. So thank you. Um, but uh, last uh, uh, November, I got off my backside and went to, uh, to Dublin because the accreditation, it's, it's, uh, it runs in Engineers Ireland as well. Um, and I spent um, three days in, in Ireland speaking to Engineers Ireland uh, into government um, bodies and the architects there about the value of accreditation. Uh, I'm, we are wholly committing, committed to raising the standards. Right, if you'll forgive me, and we're getting near the end now, um, I'm going to read through two or three slides, something that um, uh, you shouldn't do, really, um, but because it sends people to sleep. Um, but this is an important slide. Um, when you put in your application, if you're interested, um, you will... Uh, and incidentally, we have quite a high, rather like the structures exam, really, we have quite a high failure rate um, at the moment, a, a one in three. Uh, we, we're not proud of that, and we would rather that people, everybody passed. Um, but, but these are the attributes that we examine people on, and I have touched on these. Uh, you're examined on cultural significance of your project. You're submitting five case studies. Um, the aesthetic qualities and value, aesthetics of it. Investigation materials and technology with which engineers never have any problem in their submissions. Social and financial issues, running the project and being aware of how it goes. And, and, and obviously, number five, pretty much the same, implementation and management of conservation works, which people very often have a problem in demonstrating. And we don't pick those at random. There are parallel systems for the architects and for the chartered surveyors and for other um, accredited bodies in archaeology and other disciplines. And these are the standard attributes listed by the International Council on Monuments and Sites, ICOMOS. They're not made up by us, and uh, we, I sit on a group strangely called the Edinburgh Group that beats in London, and... Um, uh, 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 mostly in London, and, um, uh, and I meet with uh, cross-professional and cross-client bodies, um, 
uh, and we make sure that we are levelled in terms of our abilities and our skills. And we ask, you know, you ask yourself questions. Here we are in, in conservation accreditation. Well, this is a picture. I said it was always going to be words, but... Um, um, if you ever asked yourself, for example, philosophical questions like, what's the purpose of mortar in masonry? And you think, oh, yes, there, are, there is, a, and there is a purpose of mortar in masonry, but you've got to be a bit careful because the aqueduct in Segovia has no mortar in it whatsoever. It's built of dry stone. And it's a phenomenal engineering structure. It's not a piece of architecture, it's a piece of engineering. And, of course, it's about 2,000 years old. What is the purpose of mortar? And then you ask yourself, well, what's all this about lime? I don't understand lime. Well, you should do. I, I actually didn't, didn't do, this is a terrible confession, I didn't do A-level chemistry. I did geography instead, loved it. But um, I'm, my, my uh, chemistry of, of lime is pretty good, and it has to be. Um, and your chemistry of lime should be good too. And here's an article that I and a colleague wrote um, in the IHBC magazine context on a conservation engineer's view of lime mortars and why we use them. These are things that go in. If you don't know your lime, I venture to say you won't get through your interview um, the application process, um, um, well, there you go, that's it. Uh, you've got a form, a CV, you write a conservation philosophy. Uh, I can come back and talk about that, but uh, let's, let's get to the end first. And your five case studies. Your application is assessed, and then you attend an interview. <clears throat> Um, it's, the interview is conducted by two engineers, uh, conservation accredited engineers. Your application will also be reviewed by an architect or a surveyor who says whether they think you're any good. Um, and um, you will find the documentation, um, I regret to say, um, Jane, I regret to say, that actually the real way into it is through the ICE website. Institution of Civil Engineers website. And um, these, these people are very helpful, and, and Jane is, um, is, sits with our panel. Um, but I have to say that the IC, I have to admit the IC gives us tremendous um, secretarial support on that. And that is where you will find the register with all the names. There's one word that keeps coming up again and again when we look at conservation. It's the word passion. You want to get to conserve, to respect, and make things live. And um, here we go. Uh, this is uh, the, the register. There's an extract from the register, um, as it appears as a PDF document, download. Um, clients view it all the time. We get phone calls. We get conservation officers phone us up. There are about 70 names on the register. Uh, please, may we get to 100 quickly? Um, and um, uh, you'll see, uh, there I am, uh, James Miller, CTP Consulting Engineers down in Seven Oaks. Next one down, if you do a lot of conservation, you know Ed, Ed Morton. And in fact, in fact all the names of the people there I know, um, know them pretty well. Um, it's quite a fraternity. Um, and we get to uh, use um, the... Uh, accreditation uh, as a qualification that marks us out. Um, and in actual fact, I'm going to grab um, a leaflet that's under my bag. Um, so there are a number of these at the back, but looking by the number of you, uh, they'll have been gone in two minutes. Uh, this is a little leaflet that says um, when to use a conservation accredited engineer. And actually, we produced it as a marketing tool for our own registrants, our own members. Um, and it went with the IHBC, it distributed to 2,500 people, um, Institute of Historic Building Cons Consultants, IHBC, um, many of whom are conservation officers, and it was aimed. And we find regularly our ser member services are demanded 
through a planning, a listed building consent, and it says, before this project proceeds, a report must be um, provided by a conservation accredited <coughs> engineer. Um, just in summary, I would like to return to that slide that I didn't read in full. Conservation engineers have a passion for our past, for a respect for things that are old. We have sensitive minds to create sensitive designs, and we want to make the past live in the future. We wish to conserve and not just preserve like in a museum. Our buildings and structures must breathe in the present through human touch if they are to outlive us. Thank you very much. Compared to a new build project, yep. what's the level of construction sequence type information you have to provide? Do you have to go into a, a large amount of detail? Yep, no, thank you. Um, I, I think that um, uh, you, do, you do have to consider, and of course our legislation that drives us to that is obviously through, through CDM, Construction De Design Management. Um, um, but we, we are working with an existing structure, and so there will be constraints that you need to consider all the way through. And the classic today, actually, I'm sitting in the office with a colleague, uh, and we're looking at a, a beam within an existing building. Um, it turns out to be about eight metres span. We've got to span within an, an a floor, um, put new beams in. And um, this is, you know, you'll recognise this, but, you know, how many times do you put a beam and it's a chain dotted line on the, on the drawing and, and the bloke says, well, how am I supposed to manoeuvre that in place? So fundamentally, any beam that fits between two fixed ends, you have to understand, is it going to be brought in in two pieces so you can manoeuvre it one way, manoeuvre it the other way and put a splice in. That's, if you like, at the simple end. Um, but existing buildings, that's for, that's for every beam that fits in the building. So the starting point is yes, you've got to consider buildability and how you get the materials there in much more detail, really. Um, um, I, I, I did a throwaway line, and I didn't mean to um, make any of you who are, are graduates and you know, you're just uh, a year or two out um, to feel uncomfortable. But the truth is that I, when I first started working on existing buildings, I felt uncomfortable because my university degree hadn't pre prepared me for it at all. And there aren't any degrees that really do, on the whole. Um, yes, there you go. You, you commented at the beginning that the problem with a refurbishment type project or conservation project is what you don't know at the start of the project. Um, in my experience, it's so important that you have a good working relationship with your contractors and people that are exposing things as, as the work progresses. Would you have any comments on how to establish that working relationship with the whole construction team? Yes, um, Yes. just a, just a few. And um, I should have prefaced this by saying that although, um, uh, although I've been around the block a few times, um, there, there are probably people who have experience in other corners of the field, and I, I can see one or two of them in the room. Um, who have more experience in some areas than me. Um, however, when it, when it comes to investigations and the work, um, one of the, a few pointers. Num number one, I, I'd just like to, it's not, not an answer to yours, but that when you're doing a review, the investigations are a part, in my book, a part of design. You design a series of investigations because they're designed around what you want to achieve. If the client changes the project, you may need to do another phase of investigations because you didn't investigate that corner of the building that he now wants to change. And from my experience, that's been the case on a number of occasions. Um, an enabling works contract is good. And I actually have one um, running, just about to start running. 
um, where um, you engage a contractor um, to do certain works, which may include strip out um, and, and cleaning up the building, but also um, opening up. Um, and, and that's a useful tool to understand your building in advance. Um, if, if you're working on a project, uh, I have another one, um, which unbeknown to us became DNB, and the architects and we didn't know that, so don't, don't ask me. But, uh, 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 um, but one of the advantages is that we have a long crossover period through the tender process. Um, um, it perhaps it needs a little bit more structure to that. Um, clearly, if you've got a large project that has construction management on it, and again, forgive me for saying this, I can think of a third project where, in essence, we have investigations where there is a contractor uh, already on site working, doing small things and working his way through on investigations. And that, that's, that's a feature of a, a large project. So I think on the small end, um, you're, you're looking at um, uh, commissioning a programme of investigations, bearing in mind you've done all your desk study to start with, and that may have given you an awful lot to start with. Uh, you may have an enabling works contract, or you may have engaged a contractor early. A few pointers. James, thank you for an excellent presentation. Uh, I'd just like to ask your opinion on the importance of temporary works in conservation projects, and I say that from the perspective from the National Trust who spend millions on scaffolding each year. Thank you, Richard. Um, and, uh, yep. Um, uh, tem temporary works are, an, an, uh, again, um, I would say an equal part of what you need to be in prepared to be engaged with in conservation engineering. Now, the, the truth is that in a larger, those of you from large practices... Um, this is a generalisation. But those of you from large practices will hold temporary works at arm's length. And those of us in small practice, I used to be in big practice and now I'm in small. Um, uh, those of us in smaller practices will often be engaged in the design of temporary works. And, and as, you, as you know, um, uh, we, we design the temporary works holding up parts of Clandon, uh, Clandon Park, the mansion there. Um, after the fire, and I continue myself to inspect that every six months. I think that you have to be prepared to understand um, temporary works. And even if you're not design it, designing it or taking the responsibility for it, you have to be able to design it almost in full and understand the components that are likely to be used before obviously then passing the uh, implementation over to a specialist but you have to go a long way with them. Because in conservation, you're dealing with so much of the integration around little details and holding individual parts up. Um, and your mind must work in sufficient detail to do that. You, you uh, briefly approached uh, the three different bodies that have conservation-type accreditation, and you seem to have approached it with uh, the phrase that you coined, uh, conservation and not just preservation. In this debate of conservation of heritage, the materials are so historically variable over time that that's one of the areas that it's very, very hard to not only analyze what was like for like versus what functions today in a preservation or a conservation project. What do you feel about that as an engineer? Um, uh I have a lot of slides in another presentation that would go a long way on that. Um, I think that uh, there are two conflict, two things that pull us in different directions here, um, and um, uh, I'd like to try and make sense of that. First of all, um, that um, when we're intervene, when we uh, when we're undertaking repairs, um, in particular in masonry, let's stick with that. The article that that I showed you on lime. Um, we, uh, we go at lengths to ensure compatibility. Um, we also go sometimes perhaps almost too far in trying to analyse the basic structure, origin of the sands, the grading curves, and, and even the form of lime that went into it. 
Um, and um, uh, that is important to ensure compatibility and texture and color and, and durability that it wears at the same rate. And that's not difficult. That's very well established. If you're doing a big intervention change, we all know, and this is established, this is fine, that actually we're looking to achieve the best in terms of, very often in terms of a modern interpretation. And modern contemporary architecture of the finest quality um, is very often sits very comfortably in the context of historic buildings. And I think that's great. Um, I myself was um, engineer for the new cafe at Chiswick House Gardens um, in white concrete and Portland stone um, by Caruso Sinjin, and I'm very proud of that. It's a little building, but I actually keep pictures of it. Um, somewhere in between, um, there's, there's the fact that um, we made big mistakes with reinforced concrete in the 30s and 40s. We put heavy structures at the top of seismic buildings, not in this country, but countries abroad when repairing church towers and, and, and such through that era, and that's come back to haunt us. Uh, so so uh, appropriate use is important. I, I, think, I think that appropriate use of contemporary materials is fine, but not on the whole for repair. Hi. Yeah, just wanted to ask on materials um, and with care engineers, is there a lot of materials engineers and materials scientists that get involved as opposed to structural and civil engineers um, overall that you that you see and experience? Um, I think it's very valuable that there are now quite a number of um, specialist companies and um, we who are conservation engineers, we get little flyers from them and advertising their services. And I think it's very valuable that there are many companies now uh, dotted around, not just the large ones, and I, I don't mind advertising, obviously Sandbergs are a, a great ally to, to what we do. Um, but there are lots of smaller companies. Uh, that, that is very useful. On the whole, um, of course, they are offering their services um, and their specialist field is too, almost too specialist to integrate into any mainstream consultancy. So they exist in their own right. And is there a place for them? Yes, certainly there is. Um, and I, I think going back to investigations, that's part of doing a measured set of investigations. You can over-specify on investigations. It is possible to ask for things. And the real test is, what on earth am I going to do with the results when I get them? Because if they, if they don't, I, don't, I have no value for them, just, just think of them, imagine them sitting on the table and someone comes along, your boss asks you, why did you ask for that? And you, well, I don't know, it was... I thought I might need it. Um, just, just think carefully of what you do need because every investigation is, is, is potentially damaging to the, the structure, the historic structure you're looking at. Um, <clears throat> to what kind of standards would you actually be designing your, well, uh, your structure to considering that today's you know, standards are so heavily factored uh, and, and how would you apply that to the, the, the materials and the... Uh, that you're using in the structures that you actually are repairing or, or conserving or adding adding to. So, yeah. Yeah, um, uh, um, which is a very good question. Um, and I think the first port of call, there are all ways, there are a number of ways of looking at it. What, do, what standard are you applying? So this is assuming there's a material change of use um, and you're having to justify and look at, look at elements um, and make them work. Um, um, there are, in case, in case you didn't know, there are, there's a very recognised um, figure um, for um, uh, bearing stress on old London stock brickwork. Um, so we all quote that, um, and you can do better than that. If you take a few bricks out, maybe a minimum of um, four samples of two, crush a few, and you can work, work your way up from that. That's great. Um, uh, in terms of standards... Um, the first port of call, I think, I, I, is to look back at the code to which it was designed and to reassess it in accordance with that code. Because 
There are buildings all around the country. Stand, this is assuming it was designed sort of later than, you know, First World War, um, um, because it will be codified. Um, um, because there are all sorts of buildings that will have been standing in accordance with that design code, um, and that is the first measure of whether the guys were competent and whether you understand it. Um, very often people will do that and say, oh, I don't know how it's standing up at all. In which case the answer is probably they're looking at the wrong load paths or have done the wrong numbers. So try and analyse it to the old code. Um, if that doesn't work, of course, you can um, analyse, uh, test it to death, poor thing, and try and uh, justify it to a modern code. Um, there is the option, and I think this is, is, is if you have a good understanding of it and you, you know how it works and you have a good confidence in its performance, you can undertake a load test. And load testing is a very important tool, very powerful tool. I think particularly on means of escape, um, pen check, cantilever stairs and things like that, we, you know, we very often worry about them or we feel you can't understand them. Uh, analysis of pen check stairs isn't terribly difficult. Um, but nevertheless, load testing is, is, can be useful. Um, uh, des design codes, I think, if, if at all possible, you have an existing building and there's no material change of use, I'd encourage you, if you see no defects in it, um, don't feel you have to go there because you're only going to open up a can of worms. And the building's per there's no change of use. There's no defects. That's important. You're looking around the building, there are no defects. Because if, if there's no change of use and it's full of cracks, uh, hey, this building didn't work to start with. But if there's no change of use and no defects, and that's a point I make in the, in the paper on loading, then why are you analysing it? And if at all possible, I'd try and get to that position. 